turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5 from verse 21. Submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. Wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body, of which he is the Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit to their husbands in everything. Husbands, Love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word, and to present her to himself as a radiant church without stain or wrinkle or any other blemish, but holy and blameless. In this same way, husbands ought to love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. After all, no one ever hated his own body, but he feeds and cares for it, just as Christ does the church, for which we are members of his body. For this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. This is a profound mystery, but I am talking about Christ and the church. However, each one of you also must love his wife as he loves himself, and the wife must respect her husband. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. Slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Obey them not only to win their favor when their eye is on you, but like slaves of Christ, doing the will of God from your heart. Serve wholeheartedly as if you were serving the Lord, not men because you know that the Lord will reward everyone for whatever good he does, whether he is slave or free. And masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Do not threaten them, since you know that he who is both their master and yours is in heaven, and there is no favoritism with him. This is the word of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning, and uh, may I add my welcome to that of Dean earlier on. My name is Denzel Abrams, if you don't know me, um, and it's my privilege to uh, bring God's word, this tough word, uh, to us this morning. Um, our rector-elect, uh, Glenn Lyons, is doing confirmation serv a, a confirmation service in the Borland, and uh, our brother Graham is booked off sick. Uh, please continue to pray for him. But we here, uh, we here uh, with each other uh, in the presence of no one other but the Lord God Almighty. If I say the word submission, what comes to mind? Is that a trigger for you, both men and women? Well, as we continue in our sermon series and our in-depth reading of this great letter that Paul writes to the church, we get deeper into the nitty-gritty of Christian living. If you are a believer here this morning, a disciple of Jesus Christ, a follower uh, striving to follow him wholeheartedly. God, through Paul, is reminding you, Christian, to walk in the light of what you have received in Jesus Christ and the plan that God is bringing to fruition in this Jesus. To live, to walk, is not sitting back and waiting for heaven. To live and walk is action. Um, chapter 4, verse 1 uh, 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 exhorted us to live a life, to walk a life worthy of the calling that you have received. And that, according to the plan of God, and that plan of God was actually set before the beginning of time. And it's revealed to us, recorded for us in chapter 1, verse 10, which is to unite 
all things, all things in heaven and on earth under the authority and the headship of Jesus. That is the plan that God set out before the beginning of time. If you are not a Christian here this morning, I hope that you will be attracted uh, to this amazing eternal plan of God, the creator of all things, and perhaps consider your desperate need of a Savior in Jesus Christ for eternity. In our passage, the Apostle Paul uses three examples from life, from the world around us, to show us how that plan of God set out before the beginning of time is being fulfilled. Three examples of human relationships, marriage, family, and the workplace. And when God's plan is being worked out in practice, on the ground, the actions of those within these relation, relationships, the actions of them speak truth louder than words. I tell you that on the authority of the scripture. And it shows that the gospel is indeed changing lives in those relationships that are submitted to the headship of Jesus. That is what Paul is going to try and show us from this passage this morning. But I need help because this is a tough passage. I need help to be clear and you need help to listen carefully even though Siegfried has prayed already like that. Will you bow with me as we together come before the Lord for help? Father, thank you for the Bible. Thank you, Lord, that we have it in our hands in a language that we can understand. Thank you when this word is opened, you are at work by a spirit working powerfully through speaker and listener. Oh, Lord, will you bless us this morning as we, as we listen to this word to all of us this morning. Help us, Lord, to know that because of us being here this morning, we have met with the living God, speaking in an audible voice to each and every one of us. Lord, please, as has been prayed earlier on, will you help us not just to be hearers, but do us also for Jesus' sake. Amen. So what does the word submission do for you? I believe this text, if we take the word of God seriously, forces us, forces us to ask that question. A genuine, a question of genuine and sincere introspection. What does this word submission do for you? In my serving as a pastor, I see that the idea of submission doesn't sit well with many of us just doesn't sit well. God, you don't have to tell me. I know the Bible. I know everything. I'm a man. I'm a woman in position of power and authority. I have a top job. I'm very educated. Do you know who I am? I don't actually have to submit to anyone. But friends, try as we might. We cannot get away from this instruction of, of God's word of authority to us to submit, to not think of ourselves more highly than we should, to not think of ourselves better than others. Yesterday, as I was typing this, my final draft for this morning's sermon, as I was typing this, my son Clint texted me to ask me to do something which would have disturbed my train of thought terribly. And I promptly replied, I, I'm very busy, actually, I can't, I can't help you. But as I was typing this, the Lord very graciously showed me verse 21 as the key, the key to better understand the order of things in our various relationships. Giving thanks always for all the things in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to the God and Father, being subject to one another out of reverence for Christ, verse 21 of chapter 5. To be subject to one another, why? Out of reverence for the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, submission in all forms of the Christian life flows from an understanding of who Jesus is. It flows from an understanding of what Jesus has done for us. You see, that must be our driving force as we work through these relationships and examples today from this text. Please will you bear that in mind as we go through this extraordinary passage of Scripture. 
And let us pray uh, that the Lord, as we sang earlier on, that the Lord will really renew our minds, that the Lord will really help us grasp His plan for us, and how these relationships ought to be lived out in the light of this great, amazing, eternal plan of God. And as we strive for that, may the Lord help us to reflect on the order of His plan and the knowledge of the gospel of Jesus. There's quite a lot um, in this text that was read to us. We won't be able to touch on everything unless you're okay to sit here until 2 o'clock this afternoon. And then I don't, I don't think we'll, it will be, even be finished by then. But your connect, group, uh, your connect group leaders will be happy to engage uh, with you on anything that is not covered here this morning. Please will you do that this week in your connect groups? Engage with them. Engage with one another. The big thing that I want to try and bring out today is this plan of God coming to fruition in this human relationships and these lived out expressions of Christian unity reflecting the unity that we have in Christ. Dear friends, God has a plan. I remind you, God has a plan and you are in it. We are in this great and amazing plan of God. That must wow you. It must wow you. So firstly, uh, to, uh, uh, Paul talks about the marriage relationship. Verse 22. Wives, submit to your own husbands as you do to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife as Christ is the head of the church, his body of which he is the Savior. Right off the bat, we are confronted head on with this idea of submission. A word, mind you, that has become a dirty word almost. It's not a universally uh, popular or accepted thing today. Uh, so, so it's things like this, I reckon. It's things like this in the Bible that can make Christianity seem very outdated, very, very much not in touch, irrelevant, uh, old school values to relationships with no place in our world today. However, and this is the genius of the Word of God, we see that Paul, who writes this, he connects the teaching about marriage and submission, which elevates it uh, above 21st century values to something that is truly everlasting. He connects it. He connects marriage, this teaching about marriage and submission to the picture of the values exhibited in the Lord Jesus Christ himself. I mean, it's quite incredible. Paul wants his readers and us to see, and it's very important what he does here. He wants us to see that Jesus and the church are the model for our human marriage. That is where he makes his point. That is where, he, where it comes from. Remember chapter 1 verse 10? God is in his plan. God is bringing all things together under one head. Remember the end of the prayer of chapter 1, verse 15. God appointed him, Jesus, to be head over everything for the church. And so, uh, to, uh, verse 24 of chapter 5 goes on. Now, as the church submits to Christ, so also wives submit to their husbands. Don't miss that. Don't miss that. As the church submits to Jesus, so wives submit to their husbands. As someone said, marriage is a scale model on the ground to demonstrate what's going on in the heavenly realities. Because in the heavenly realities, the church, the bride, submits to Jesus, the bridegroom. It's a beautiful picture, dear friends. So if you like, a good de definition of submission here is placing oneself under the authority of someone or something else. Of course, Paul spoke these words from within a, 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 um, a cultural context back in the day. And it certainly, it certainly would have been revolutionary for Paul's years to hear this at the time in Ephesus. Because they were used to having a rule having rules for their wives. It was a norm for them to have a rule for their wife. 
There was absolutely no expectation that the husband would sacrificially love his wife and submit himself to her needs. So this thought was revolutionary in Paul's day. And dare I say, it is revolutionary in our day, but for different, th different reasons. But God's design, dear friends, God's design is always better than whatever the cultural expectations of the day happen to be. My wife works with wood. That is her uh, arts and crafts. That's her hobby. She absolutely loves it. She's actually very good in designing and putting together wooden stuff like a book rack or a little table or a little cabinet. She has most, and I watch her, uh, she has most of the tools required. Thank you, Discovery Vitality and Denzel for running so much. <laughs> now, she's got all the tools that she needs. She cannot use the drill, though, to cut a piece of wood. Try as she might. She must use a jigsaw for that. The jigsaw is designed to cut. The drill is designed to make a hole. It is God's design. It is God's design that the church places herself willingly under the authority and headship of Jesus Christ. And so Paul says we allow him to be the head. And wives are to, like the church submits, submit themselves to their husbands. That is the design. There is no other way around that. That is God's design. But of course, we must point at this point acknowledge some negative connotations about submission. It's worth talking about these things. Otherwise, it festers. You see, in our society, male headship can be equated to some kind of male oppression, uh, some dominance and even subjugation of men. But the Apostle Paul who wrote this, he leaves no room whatsoever in this passage for us even to consider anything like that. Because in no way, in no way are those things true of how Jesus relates to the church. No way at all. And there absolutely is no way in which they can or should feature in a Christian marriage. Nor does it imply that women are any less valuable in their relationship. Because the Bible consistently shows that men and women have equal value and are equally precious in the sight of God. At the same time, they are not identical either. They have different roles to play in their marriage and in the family. As in the Trinity, we have God the Father, we have God the Son, we have God the Holy Spirit. Three persons, all God. But they are not absolutely identical. They have different roles to play in the Holy Trinity of God. The Bible often talks about how Jesus, Jesus the Son, the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Jesus the Son submits to his Father's will, willingly placing himself under the authority of his Father. And when we think of that, dear friends, it makes sense and in no way implies any inferiority about Jesus. He is equally and fully God. Just because he submits to his father doesn't take anything away from him. And so it is with marriage. As the wife places herself under the authority of the husband and allows him to lead, uh, to be the head, it doesn't mean that she's weaker than the husband. It doesn't mean that the husband is smarter than her. It doesn't mean that, the, that she doesn't have any opinion. No, this means that this is God's design for wives. And it involves in part being submissive to her own husband. So whatever the world throws at you, my dear sisters in Christ, whatever the world throws at you, there is good and there is proper order to your relationship with your husband as a wife. Submission is, in marriage is that ordering of relationship and the outworking of God's plan to unite all things under Jesus. And if men, if we husbands thought we could get away with it easily, the Apostle Paul raises the bar. Husbands, verse 25, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's a tall order. It's a very tall order indeed. It's an order a command which requires true devotion, deep devotion, 
It is an order which requires absolute commitment. And it's an order that requires unwavering love. As a pastor, I see so many issues arise, arise out of an inability or perhaps a refusal for people to do just that, to be devoted, to be committed, to love like Jesus loved. I see many marriages and relationships around that reflect the attitude of selfishness, myself included sometimes. Now just an aside, if you are not married, you may have switched off. Please don't. Please don't switch off. Selfishness is a big problem, not just of marriages, but true of every relationship actually. Selfishness causes problems without number. Ask me, I've been there and I'm still struggling with it. Because how easy is not it to just look after me, after my? How easy it is for the husband to look, to look after his own interest only. To put his needs first and not his wife's, both with time and with mental energy. How easy is that? And equally, Equally, it is quite possible then for the wife to usurp authority from her husband and not let him lead her and their family. See, that's a devil's ploy. Be careful. And that so much plays into what the word the world tells us. Look after yourself. Make number one. Stay number one. Don't become number two. You see, what Paul is asking of Christians flies in the face of that. Husbands? Love your wives. When Debbie and I were married, we were not Christians. So no marriage prep. Nothing at all. And the man who married, married us, bless him. I'll never forget what he said to me when we did the rehearsal the day before for our wedding, and, uh, for, for our wedding ceremony. He said that if, if and when I love my wife the way I should, a lot of trouble will be sorted. Actually, he was right. When I and any Christian husband strives to love his wife the way Jesus loves the church, flip, a lot of things can be sorted out. Husbands, don't love yourself first. Look after your wives as you would after your own body. Now, in an ideal world, it would be nice after a hard day's work. I said this at the 8 o'clock service and this fell flat, but hopefully here it will, maybe you'll get what I'm saying. In an ideal world, it, be, it would be nice after a hard day's work. As husband and wife arrive back home, it would be nice, wouldn't it, to have a nice tidy house, um, children all bathed, they're all fed, they're in bed, sleeping. That would be grand, wouldn't it? How grand that would be. I know our children, uh, with the young families, would absolutely love that. And those here with young families, you would love that, right? You would absolutely love that. But in the real world, as husband and wife arrive home at the same time, they're both knackered, everyone's tired, their children is groggy, uh, they need to be bathed and fed. After a hard day, the husband needs to ask, how do I love my wife as Christ loves the church? How will I do that now, right now? Now, of course, it's going to be different for each of us. But ultimately, my wife's needs, your wife's needs must come first, always. Maybe cook the dinner, maybe bath one child, do homework with the other, take out the dirt. You see the point? It may be trivial, but actually, doing this will say more than, I love you, my darling. This is action, not just words. Action. And this applies to a million and one different things in which a husband can love his wife. Put her needs first to demonstrate, to show that God's plan is at work, that God's plan is being fulfilled, and that these relationships, my marriage, is reflecting it. Now granted, this won't always be easy, but when the husband reminds himself of what God is doing in the world, that his plan is being worked out on the ground, it will give this husband certainty, and actually encouragement, that his marriage is a reflection 
of the way how Christ loved the church first and gave himself up for the church. And that will hopefully be the driving force behind his motivation to keep on loving his wife even when it's hard. There are many, 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 many more ways in which a husband can nourish and cherish, cherish his wife as verse 29 says. See, again, it stems from showing her that same selfless love that Jesus exhibited on the cross. Maybe you are not married. Maybe you are single. Maybe you are divorced. Maybe you have a broken relationship. Well, the Lord knows. The Lord knows your position. And the Lord is very much aware of your position. But the same principles of submission apply to all of us. Submit to one another out of reverence for the Lord Jesus Christ, married or not. Secondly, Paul turns to the realm of the family life. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. And fathers, do not exasperate your children. Here again, here again we see the plan recorded for us in chapter 1 verse 10 of, of God being worked out on the ground but in a different context. This time it's, it is in family life and with children. And you know, I thought quite a lot about this. In this world that we are living in, in this society, uh, in, a, in a world of child-centered parenting, everything revolves around the child as well as single parent households. This again may seem very much out of place. Very old-fashioned, rubbing against the grain of culture. Both with the insistence of discipline and instruction, as well as the assumption that both father and mother are present in the family home. Especially that bit about bringing your child up in the discipline and instruction of the Lord and in the ways of the Lord. I mean, if someone stood up yesterday at the Job uh, parade, uh, Pride Parade, they would have shot them down, maybe burned them at the stake even. You see, that would be criticized today to bring up your child in the ways and instruction of the Lord. I mean, should we not allow children uh, to make up their own minds about things? This stuff that Paul is spewing out here is nonsense. It sounds a bit like indoctrination, like brainwashing. How can you possibly tell a child what to think? But then again, there is, as you read the text, there is great attraction to this loving, settled family unit. Because of this plan that God has in place. To bring everything under the headship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Children ought to be ob obedient. Period. Because this is right, says Paul. The Apostle Paul quotes from the Ten Commandments to show that this is not something new. This is not something he just thought about or invented. You see, even though Paul was never married, even though Paul um, uh, never had children, he didn't have a family and kids, he, Paul, as the apostle was given the authority to speak on behalf of God. This is the standard which he expects Christians, Christian families to follow. And even when children leave parents' home, that duty to obedience may no, may no longer be the same, but the command to honor their father and mother still stands. Without intending to make the childless and those whose homes are broken feel Failures, this passage shows the value of having a home with two loving parents who teach the children about the Lord Jesus Christ. Children, obey your parents. And then Paul says, talk, uh, talks to fathers. Fathers, nurture your children. By that demonstration, we see what a privilege it is to bring up children in the ways of the Lord. And what an influence we fathers can have in bringing up and nurturing children to know and love, and love the Lord. And that's a good thing. So it's not to be heavy-handed. It's not to provoke and exasperate children, make them angry. Uh, if there's one thing that I could change, if I, if I would do over if I could, it would be to change the way I was a dad to our daughter, Lindsay. I almost lost her as a teenager because I was so, so, so strict. Understandably, she didn't like me because I said no too many times. 
I had, I had a responsibility to protect her and my family my way. Thankfully, thank God for passages like this that helped me see God's perspective. And I actually came to understand that both our children, God is their father, not their grandfather. He is their father. I needed to show her what fatherhood according to God's word looks like. Again, to those who are childless, you are not a second-rate Christian. There's nothing wrong with you. God loves you. He would use you to be a mom or a dad to others, either through the wonderful gift and privilege of, of uh, adoption or being a parental support to family and to friends. So parents, apply chapter 6, verse 4, and remember chapter 5, verse 21, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. Thirdly, Paul deals with the realm of slaves and masters. Uh, verse 5, slaves, obey your earthly masters with respect and fear and with sincerity of heart, just as you would obey Christ. Here again, we come up against something which at first appears to rub up against what we are confronted with in our society. It goes completely against the grain in our 21st century context. By the way, this is not this language is not the kind of language that we would use today, is it? This is not a familiar category. We don't use slaves and masters language, and we shouldn't actually. But I want us to get to what Paul wants his readers to know. Remember that Paul is speaking to the Ephesian context, and he's speaking in the light of cultural relationships that they had at that time. In the Roman Empire at the time, slaves and masters were very much part of society, unlike um, uh, with us today. Apparently, some slaves and some masters had become followers of Jesus Christ through the gospel message. Well, how would they handle those relationships of master and slave and slave and master? Well, Paul points to simply mutual love and submission. Mutual love and understanding and submission. There were, of course, some differences between the slavery of Paul's day and the slavery of the Western world during the 1800s. Uh, first of all, slavery in Paul's day was not based on the kidnapping of a particular ethnicity of people. People became slaves in Paul's day due to a variety of reasons, including being born out of sl into slavery, being sold or abandoned by parents, being captured in war. That's how you became a slave. Be, uh, an inability to pay debts. Uh, furthermore, God's word condemns the kind of slavery that we saw in the 1800s. Above all, the Bible teaches that every human being is made in the image of God. And when Jesus Christ died on the cross, he died so that they might have their sins paid for and that they might know God, just like we had our sins paid for and we can get to know God. We must be clear that slavery, particularly in the form that we read about in the 1800s, it was evil. It was sinful. It was wicked. It was wrong. So Paul is not addressing the merits of evil, of slavery. He is addressing some of the relationships that were present in Ephesus at the time. Slaves and masters. He tells slaves to willingly serve their masters and to serve them well. He doesn't instruct the slaves to serve this way because they have wonderful masters. No, he tells the slaves to serve this way because they are followers of Jesus. They understand chapter 1 verse 10 that God is bringing everything in unity under Christ. And as such, they live a life of submission. They live a life of love. They live a life of honoring others. They are to serve others, including their masters, for the glory of God. See, we cannot get away from separating chapter 1 verse 10 to these instructions here about relationships. And like with all these relationships, there's a word to the one under authority as there's a word to the one in authority. Think God's glory. Masters, treat your slaves in the same way. Read that Bible slowly and you see how that is absolutely revolutionary. Has, um, masters, treat your slaves in the same way. This would have probably floored those listening in Paul's day. 
as it would bosses and CEOs today. Treat your slaves the same way. Wow. Paul is telling masters to show love, to show honor, to show submission, and to show Christ-likeness even to their slaves. That's incredible stuff. My brothers and sisters, this, this is the power of the gospel at work because it is the gospel, the gospel of Jesus that changes everything. This is the beauty of mutual love and submission among the followers of Jesus. This is God's design. This is God's order. This is His structure. This is good and it is right, even in the workplace. And it goes for marriage and family as well. So as, as a Christian, there is a right and proper duty to obey earthly masters. Actually, we can all appreciate that whether we are Christians or not. But there is a challenge for workers. In Paul's language, for slaves. We are to, we are to obey our earthly bosses not only when their eyes are on us, when they're watching, when they're looking at what, we're, what we are doing, but this passage reminds us that even though the CEO or the director or the manager or the supervisor has been rightly appointed as our boss, we also have our ultimate master, our boss's boss in heaven, God. Look at verse 9. It says that God will judge fairly between servants and masters. Even though someone may appear more powerful than us today, at the end of the day, there won't be any special privilege, no ranking. Everyone will be on even keel. No special privilege. Why? Well, because we are to render service to God ultimately. We are to render service to the audience of one. That is who we are serving when we are in the office or in the workshop or working in the garden or doing house cleaning or wherever we work. It is God that we give our service and obedience to. And that includes working hard and well for our earthly masters. God sees that and he acknowledges that. Again, to the unemployed, to those struggling to find a job to provide for your family, the Lord God Almighty is not unaware of your predicament. He is at work. Trust him. Wait for him. Keep on asking, keep on speaking to him, keep on, keep on asking him. So there we have it, three different types of relationships. Christians, Christian relationships we, which call for a radical submission in all parts of life. Uh, and I say all parts because, because between work and the home and the family and the marriage, we kind of cover all of life. Paul seems to have deliberately chosen those examples to show that this is how all of life should be ordered, should be run as a Christian. Is it easy to submit? Is it easy to love the way we should? Is it easy to obey, to obey and do what God expects of us? No, it isn't. It's not easy to do these things. By no means is it easy. But you know, the, the, the immediate context of this text is actually very helpful. If you look at chapter 5, verse 18, don't get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. And if you look at chapter 6, verse 12, finally, be strong in the Lord. And then when we remember the prayer in chapter 1, he says, I pray that the Lord will give you power. You see, we, this is not easy stuff to love and obey and to honor and to submit, but we have help. We have help from no one other than the Lord God himself. The Spirit of God at work, the power of the Lord. These things are hard, they're tough. But reading and contemplating on this becomes clear that Paul has set out quite a compelling and refreshing vision of what Christian relationships should be. They're not impossible. It's not insurmountable. Brothers and sisters, our relationships and how we live them out, it can shout loudly to a world doesn't want to know about God and His Christ. Because as we live it out, we show the world who our master is. 
So here is indeed something to aim for. These words and actions are so powerful that, that those in the heavenly realms will know about it when we get it right. So we began by thinking that the Bible can appear old-fashioned, can be out of date, its values and its standards, so out of touch. But I hope that you will see that according to God's word, our world has got it wrong. These relationships matter a great deal. It is a good and refreshing way of seeing how to live out these relationships in the light of God's eternal plan to bring everything under the headship of Jesus because that is actually the best possible approach. Let's pray. Maybe a moment for you to make your own private, quiet response to God's word to you this morning.